Uh, next up, we're going to hear a talk from Dr. Ankur Desai. Um, Professor Desai holds the Ned P. Smith profes Professorship of Climatology, is Associate Chair and Professor of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences here at UW-Madison. Um, he's a micrometeorologist and ecologist who investigates how space and time scales influence ecosystem exchanges of greenhouse gases, energy, and momentum in the atmosphere. Uh, his investigations include fuel-based measurements using tall eddy covariance towers and meteorological air research aircraft in addition to computational numerical simulation of ecosystem dynamics in the atmosphere. And personally, I consider uh, Professor Desai is one of the world's leading experts uh, in the use of eddy flux towers and eddy covariance uh, data uh, for understanding rapid exchanges between the land surface and the atmosphere and the impacts of land management and climate change on those exchanges. So uh, the title of his talk is Taming Ecological Modeling and Forecasting with an Informatics Approach. So please help me welcome Dr. Ankur Desai. Thanks, Chris, for the kind words. Um, so so as, as Chris mentioned, I am a uh, climate scientist and ecologist, and I work across the street in the Atmospheric Oceanic Space Sciences Building. Um, and I appreciate the shout outs that Dean Barker gave to some of the work that meteorologists did uh, many decades ago in many ways at really trying to solve a really puzzling problem in forecasting with data assimilation. But I'm going to convince you today that actually um, that was a much easier problem than you're trying to solve here. Weather forecasting is actually not that hard. Don't tell people that. But, um, and uh, you know, as we just saw in the examples from Mark's talk, um, there are a lot of really diverse questions, a lot of very complicated data. Um, so what I was going to talk about today, and I apologize in advance, this isn't, I don't have a lot of agriculture background, so this is mostly a little bit of a talk about some of the challenges we've been facing in big data and informatics and the work I do in trying to predict the fate of ecosystems in a changing climate. Uh, so this is mostly a think piece to maybe think a little bit about how we can promote a culture of informatics and big data at this university. Um, and this will lead you into the break, which I think is next. I suppose we're in a theater, so we should call it an intermission. Um, um, so it will lead you to the intermission to maybe get some conversation going over coffee as much as anything else. Um, and so we'll start with that. And so just to even get you going right away, I'll just give you my take home. So in case we run out of time or the rest of this is less interesting to you. Um, Big data, we've been hearing a lot about data volume, and it's almost mind-boggling, even from the, just from the last talk, right? The, the size of the data, the types of data. Um, but one of the things I think that's really important to remember is that in many ways, the really big data sets are actually the easiest ones to deal with, because machines know how to work with big data. But a lot about big data is more than about the volume of the data. It's really about the diversity and complexity of the data. And I'm going to try to convince you that actually some of the smallest data sets are some of the hardest to deal with. Um, it's about how easy it is to access. We just had heard a question about commercial data providers and data availability and data access, and that's a really big question, right? If we want machines to learn from data, it needs a way to be able to access it, right? And then finally, we need to know information about the data. If I just gave you a whole petabyte of remote sensing data and didn't tell you where it was from or how it was processed or anything like that, it's completely useless, right? Because we want to be able to test hypotheses, we're scientists here, uh, that uh, with this data, right? The second thing is that we spend a lot of time thinking about the data and the cool toys, and it's fun to look at movies and all this data and things, but really, and, and we just saw this in the, in the last couple slides from Mark, the Venn diagrams, uh, the challenges that we have in informatics, that is making useful inferences from data and from models, um, is, about people, right? It's really about how we, right? And our brains aren't getting bigger, I don't think, that fast. Um, our, in fact, our minds are shrinking lately. Um, and, 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 and so we're getting bigger data, but it's really about how we interact with each other. We have to build stronger networks, right, to actually be able to process and understand and make inference from this data. And really, the real challenge is not in just, oh, a petabyte data. That's not a big deal. I work in a building, right, like uh, Dean Barker said, that generates petabytes of data. And we, we just deal with it, right? That's not the big deal. We can just get more hard drives. The real question is, how do you 
um, work together to actually make this work? And how do you do this in an ethical way? All right, because a lot of what we heard, right, you can do a lot of bad science with machine learning, right? And 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 we've seen that go wrong, even in the commercial sector, right? Even when uh, things like uh, Google image search incorrectly identifies or has racial bias in the way it identifies people and things like that. Um, so some of the examples I'm going to talk to you is a little bit about just how we work together and how we deal with some of those challenges, right? And finally, I just want to hopefully leave a little bit of think, and I think we'll hear more from some later talks. Looks like some exciting initiatives are already happening uh, here on campus, including this symposia. Uh, that University of Wisconsin is probably well positioned to be a leader here, especially in the agricultural environmental arenas. Given the scope of the science that we do at CALS, I'm in letters and science actually, but I benefit a lot from the work I do across colleges. Um, and but of course, the challenge here is that you have to spend money to make money, right? And so we or to make science, and so we have to decide how we're going to invest in this in a reasonable way. So that's, that's my whole talk. The rest is just pretty pictures. So I start with this. This isn't necessarily big data, but in my field, I do I look at the fate of ecosystems that are changing climate, and uh, this is the single most important figure in our field, right? This is the increase in carbon dioxide concentration at Mauna Loa uh, since uh, the start of this from the work of Charles Ke David Keeling. Uh, who started very much with uh, just a hunch, really, that atmospheric CO2 was rising and changing. Uh, up until this time, oceanographers kind of assumed that uh, the oceans took up all the CO2 that we emitted in a relatively quick turnaround time. And it was his advisor, uh, Ravel, who basically did some of the first measurements in the ocean to say, wait a second, that doesn't seem to be the case. The point I wanted to make here is a lot of the data we take right, in climate science is really about getting a whole bunch of different perspectives on a system, in this case CO2, and most of these data don't intend it to start out that way. Charles Keeling's first paper is three years of data, right? And it, those of you who are PIs know why it's three years. That's a grant cycle, right? Um, and so this, pro this single measurement was actually put together from three-year grants over and over and over again, having to convince the funders that this is new science, this isn't monitoring. It wasn't really becoming a monitoring effort until about the late 1970s when Department of Energy and NOAA started to do some more of this, after taking it over from Scripps. So a lot of times we don't even know we're collecting big data when we start. And it's important to think about one of the real benefits that Charles Keeling did was that he was really good at archiving this data, really good at putting metadata, and really good at convincing people that long-term observations are how we're going to make sense of the climate system. Right? And beyond a seasonal cycle, which is, of course, the cycle of vegetation uh, growing and senescing in the northern hemisphere, uh, we also have a long-term annual cycle. And it's really from this long-term measurement that we start to understand things like the amount of CO2 that we would expect in the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning is about twice what we actually observe, which is fascinating. And it's really a signal that we've learned over time from combining these with many other types of measurements of the terrestrial biosphere acting as a growing carbon sink. So the question we want to ask, right, is, well, that's a big subsidy, right? That allows us to potentially emit more fossil fuels than we would uh, be able to otherwise if we're concerned about the impacts of climate change on society and ecosystems. So what did the data we collect in my lab do for? You know, we're trying to understand and measure the fate of global warming greenhouse gases. Of course, there's a huge contribution from agricultural systems in this, and so there are some interesting questions that overlap with some of the things you might be thinking about. We also try to then combine these with theories of how atmosphere and the climate uh, interact with e ecological systems. We think of these as feedbacks. Uh, and the only way we try to understand these feedbacks is long-term multi-scale observations. Right. And the real goal, the informatics goal, is really, as we saw in some of the examples in the last talk, with fusing these, right? Using models, using data assimilation, using pattern recognition, using machine learning to confront models, which are essentially our set of theories, hypotheses. Some of these are discoverable because they're machine learned. Some of these are directly put in because they're based on first principles. This is the other reason the weather forecasting problem is a little easier. We actually know all the first principles of meteorology, it's just Newton's laws. Um, but we don't in the case of climate, the climate system or in ecosystems, right? And so we have to then confront these models to actually be able to test and understand whether our understanding is correct. So this is what maybe a typical land surface model. We saw the Cupid model, so that was the cartoon version. This is the more schematic version from Gordon Bonin of how a forest uh, ecosystem model, these are the processes you might have to simulate in that model. There's a lot of them. They operate on multiple time scales, on multiple spatial scales. And in many ways, the big data problem is also about the big model problem. 
right? And that really the complexity, the reason we collect diverse and large data is really because the models, our theories of how this Earth system works are also very complex and diverse. And it's important not to think just about the data, but also about what is it that we're actually trying to measure or simulate or predict. The challenge is, in the carbon cycle world, we have a very, very embarrassing figure. This is the other most reproduced figure in all of the conferences I go to. This is known as the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, which is how all of the climate models around the world, there's about 23, get together every few years and run models forward based on projections from economists of how the climate's going to change. That's what then feeds into the climate change reports you hear about. Um, if you run these models forward and ask them about the terrestrial carbon cycle and how much CO2 uptake is going to continue in the future, remember Remember, we saw that today there's a pretty large uh, subsidy from the terrestrial biosphere that's taking up CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, you get, uh, that doesn't look very good, does it? But we call that spaghetti. Um, like, okay, well, fine. We can go and make better models. It's good until 1950. That's true, because, you know, it's really good when you can tune your models to data, right? Um, so uh, that's nice, but this is not that good. We can send the models go back. There are thousands of people involved in these things. They change parameterizations. They change land surface schemes. They do all sorts of things, and they come back, and it actually gets worse. <laughs> so in many ways, this isn't as bad as it looks, because in some ways, this spread, these models are much more sophisticated. They have more realistic processes. It's just that the processes have large divergences based on small differences in parameters. So even though there's more spread, we actually know more. Right, so there's less unknowns. So the question is, what do we need to do? How can we use data to make sense of this? So this is a picture off of one of our uh, eddy covariance flux towers in northern Wisconsin. This one's a particularly tall one, so this is looking out at a couple hundred meters above the ground. And we collect a lot of continuous data on ecosystem scale fluxes of greenhouse gases, of energy, of momentum. Uh, we measure these things at around 10 times a second to 20 times a second up to uh, minutes, and we combine these data to make inferences about ecosystem carbon exchange in one case. So in this case, here is half hourly estimates of ecosystem carbon exchange in a forest over a year. You can see winter, it's quiescent. In the summer, negative numbers mean uptake, because meteorologists view the world that way. You're taking CO2 away from us in the atmosphere. So that's, uh, that's biospheric growth. So you probably view this as net productivity or a positive number. Uh, but you can see a very strong, also seasonal cycles, diurnal cycles. Um, you can see the phenological cycle. You can see plants uh, kind of becoming very active very rapidly in the system. Phenology is pretty fast in northern Wisconsin. Um, lots and lots of information. You can also see noise, right? I actually purposely left out, left in bad data in this. You can also see data gaps, right? This is when uh, one of my students might have knocked over a cable or an ice storm came through or we just couldn't process the data because of something. This is the type of data we have to work with, right? And we have to come up with algorithms to understand this. But I only show this just to show the types of examples. Not all big data is as clean and beautiful as like giant global remote sensing imagery, right? There's a lot to think about that goes into that. But we can do things with that. We can now take a single uh, uh, site with multiple years of data. This one's a forest in Oregon. And the black line is the sensitivity of productivity to light. And that kind of makes sense. You think we should know that, right? We can measure plant growth in the lab, and we can shine different amounts of light on it, and plants grow. And then if we ask 30 different models what they think about light use response uh, at this particular forest, and remember, this is whole ecosystem scale. So it's not just the leaf level. You're talking about the scaling of the leaves across the forest. You're talking about um, all of the different multiple species that might be interacting. And it's, it's messy, right? But it tells us something, right? We can use data to be able to subselect models to be able to understand how a system goes. And that's where really the data challenge is, right? How do we make this something that's more automated and routine? This took years in, of work to get this one particular paper together where we had 10 sites and maybe 20 models, right? So as an example from maybe that's a little bit more agriculturally interesting, we've recently been working on looking at multiple sets of towers across the region. So in this case, we are looking at the 2012 Midwest drought. And what we did was selected a set of sites, some in agricultural domains, some in forest domains. And if we looked at any one site, you'd hear an individual story about how um, the lack of precipitation drove uh, senescence, how an early spring might have drawn growth. And it's really only when you start to combine these data and you start to have multiple years of measurements and you combine a baseline, which is the black curve of the uh, seasonal cycle of uh, net carbon uptake, 
And uh, compared to that particular year that you start to see that we had this counterbalancing effect between an early spring really acting as a large subsidy that most future meteorological droughts are likely to be coupled with a warming effect. And so you have early springs coupled to uh, less uptake in the summer. The cool thing about this is by having multiple types of data, we were able to collect soil moisture data, heat data, evapotranspiration data. I'll just show the soil moisture in this example. The early spring uh, might have actually then led to a drawdown of soil moisture. And this is averaged across nearly a two dozen sites. So this is kind of a neat emergent phenomena uh, that then led to an intensification of the drought that would have been seen otherwise, right? And so this even provides some idea for how we might manage this drought. And that because soil moisture was depleted in the summer, the energy partitioning at the surface shifted toward heating instead of evapotranspiration. And this essentially allowed the drought, which was mostly caused by the um, weather, uh, to be persistent and to be stronger than it would be otherwise. That's the kind of information that we can get from data that we can't necessarily directly get from our models. All right. But the real challenge of this is if we actually wanted to go and prove that, my flux towers are great because I install them and we run them and we don't have to do much to them, right? But the real information is on the ground, right? The in situ measurements have to be coupled with what's actually happening. So here's a picture of two undergrads, one in mosquito netting because it is Wisconsin in the summer in a wetland, uh, working at tower sites, digging ditches, collecting plant samples to make sense of how the ecosystem operates and how exactly the sensitivity to drought might be working. And this was a, this kind of brings me to my first, the, the point I was making earlier, which is that a lot of big data problems are not on the big data volume side, but they're on the large amounts of small data that all of you have collected over many years, much of which has never been published and much of which is completely unreadable by machines. Right, so this is actually in nature neuroscience, which was interesting, uh, but the same type of problem occurs in just about every scientific field. If you were to look at some sort of histogram of data size versus number of data sets, on the left are your what we call organized big data, large volume, automated sensors, my nice continuous time series of light or something else. Um, and then the other side, which often is called long tail data, right? Because it's this statistical distribution has a very long tail. Um, and only a fraction of this is published. In this case, they argue that there is this what called the part of the long tail data that's called dark data, right? And really, a lot of the interesting questions, especially in agriculture and environmental science, are hiding out there in the uh, dark data, long tail data things. Right? All of you have collected data or all of you have had students that have collected data that is probably sitting in your filing cabinet somewhere, probably sitting in a field notebook somewhere. But if you add those all up, if you integrate it under the curve in the blue section, that number is probably equal to or larger than the side on the left under the red curve, the organized big data. And in fact, I would say some of the largest big data challenges in environmental science are not about the continuous observations, but about the very large diverse types of data you collect on crop yield, on soil carbon, on plant water use status, that most of which is collected by hand or manually or manual sensors, most of which is stored in maybe Excel spreadsheets, maybe at best, right, and possibly on just pieces of paper. Some of this is legacy data, so you might have inherited a lot of data that you have no idea where it came from or necessarily how it was exactly collected. That's probably where some of the most exciting answers are to dealing with some of those problems that I showed earlier with trying to predict future carbon cycle in the atmosphere. And then the other side of this is once you have data like that, trying to convince models to tune to that data or make sense of that data, it is a theater, so we might as well show some blood and gore, um, <laughs> is a really, really hard problem. Yeah, sorry, this gets pretty bloody. Um, <laughs> models are not scalable, models themselves have their own problem that they themselves almost act like um, um, dark data. That we generally view modeling as a cottage industry. People here are modelers and people here are empiricists and collect data. And if we really want to solve informatics challenges, you really have to be that same person or get those people in the room. Because we don't have an easy way for models to be compare themselves, assimilate data like the long tail data, right? So, we're just going to kind of focus on what is the tenets or pros of a positive informatics culture, and this will go through pretty quickly. Um, the idea here is that if we want to actually make progress in this field, we need to think about being open, collaborative, shareable, and reproducible, right? So 
what does open mean? So here are now the map of all of the currently contributing eddy covariance flux towers uh, in the globe as part of the flux net. All of this data is directly publicly accessible on a simple interface. And we often call this the coalition of the willing, right? This only came about because, and this is actually a talk of a paper we're about to submit, um, because individuals shared their data, put it up on the web, and this is a culture shift. A lot of us are trying to worry about getting scooped or about getting our data versus and, and being worried about other people using their data. And the early days of Ameriflux was a lot of fighting about data policy, data sharing, a contribution, who gets authorship for things, who, uh, what happens when you submit data to an archive, how do you make sense of it, uh, what happens, are you supposed to contact a PI or not when you collect the data, and all those things have to be solved. We have a working data policy now, I believe, uh, that seems to take care of this, and people just were willing to put data up there. If we're not open about big data, it's not big data. That's my argument. A similar point on collaborative, right? That Ameriflux worked and the eddy covariance community worked also because we were willing to share expertise with each other. We had a very active listserv uh, and as a young scientist myself in the early, uh, in the mid 1990s, uh, it was essential for me to get information from senior scientists who were willing to share expertise and ideas and this is what this data is really about. And this is becoming a larger thing, right? If you look at the NSF, Department of Eco uh, Environmental Biology, the fraction of proposals that are now multi-PI multi exceed the ones that are sole PI, right? The fraction of papers that have multiple authors, this is one I'm on that has 150 authors. Um, don't ever do this. Um, it took years and years to get through this, uh, is increasing. Right? We have to be able to work together. The big data challenge is as much about this as it is about the data itself. Here, for example, is a team of one of our informatics projects. I'm actually funded through the Department of, uh, Division of Biological Inf Informatics at in NSF. Uh, and in this case, we have uh, Anne, who is a paleoecologist who collects all sorts of long-tailed data. Uh, we have Mike here, who is a biostatistician, uh, who thinks a lot about how to fuse models and data together. We have Rob, who is hiding in the corner, uh, who is a computer scientist at the National Center for Supercomputing, who makes the magic happen when we ask, how do we make models and data work together? And it requires a team like this, like the one that we saw. And this is the, this is the Venn diagram personified. Uh, and it's such a real challenge, right? We all work in multiple universities with different languages, different cultures, and we have to use shareable, simple tools. We only get together about once a year, so this is an unusual picture. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to build informatics tools to make modeling something that's more routine, where we build application programming interfaces so that the how data and input model parameters into models is the same for any ecosystem model that you run. We use uh, post-GIS databases so that all of that long-tailed data can be inputted in simple ways. We hire armies of undergraduates to clone the literature and just input data for us. And we're starting to automate some of that with some recent projects with, uh, with OC. Uh, optical character recognition and pulling tables off its papers. And we build a web interface so that we can have uh, accessibility so that individuals can actually use and run ecosystem models and compare them to large types of data sets and share data across the network. Um, and this is known as the predictive ecosystem analyzer and building a set of open source R-based reusable tools. And this only works because I can't do all of this myself. I'm a climate scientist. I can write pieces of this. I've written all of the meteorological downscaling and meteorological conversion scripts. But it's really the computer science and the statistician works together that really makes this happen. And the other cool part about this is that this isn't a giant central project. Our goal is really to build something that's deployable on the cloud, on your local server, as a virtual machine. Uh, where in this case, we, this is our PI team where each of us are running a version of this uh, e uh, informatics tool and the data is automatically shared. If I collect leaf level observations at my server in Wisconsin in that evening, all of these other servers also have that data. So when they run models, they can compare their models to the data I collected, unless I choose to not make it public, which I can also do in this system. Finally, shareable, right? So uh, Claudio, I think, hinted at this National Ecological Observatory Network. It is one of the largest big data projects going on in ecology, right? It is a $450 million project, a super collider of ecology, uh, a set of coordinated 30-year-plus uh, ecological observing sites that address grand challenges. And it's supposed to be a community resource, consistent instruments on all sites, open data, documentation for every variable, some sort of machine readable API for data access. But it's hard. This is a hard problem. It's about 100 terabytes of data a year. 
uh, on some single server. And much of some of this is shipped in hard drives because it's so big, uh, because it's hyperspectral imaging at the centimeter scale resolution. This is kind of the current status of this. Their goal is to get this all up by the end of this year. Uh, there's currently uh, 25 sites with six months in, uh, currently running, and there's about 47 that needs to be up and running by the end of the year. And I've been working with them and thinking about how to get that data processing pipeline. Because as much as the data itself is, that, is hard to collect, it's really about how we serve and share that data in an open way, in a machine readable way. Uh, and so just with the eddy covariance data, this is a very complex diagram just of the data flow of how we get uh, the actual code that produces the flux output into some sort of uh, publicly accessible, open, shareable way. And I won't really kind of dive into this, but we've been really working on trying to build and use a lot of what's going on in Silicon Valley with code reuse, with development tools, what's called the DevOps philosophy, uh, which is how basically most large-scale software engineering projects are made these days, and trying to bring that to the ecological science community, where what we've done is started to build these little what we call packages. They're called Docker images. It's an individual virtual machine that contains everything to go from the raw data Neon collects to the actual fluxes that you need, and you don't need to know how to compile the code. You don't need to know how to do much other than install this one software package that's made by this private company that's provided free, and then you can deploy it. And then if you decide I want to do one site, I want to run this at 100 sites, all I do is copy that to Amazon or to any other cloud-based system, and I can scale up instantly without having to know all of the details of how to do uh, large-scale computing or high-performance computing, right? And so there's a paper on this in review on how to do this, and the cool thing now is that we're showing that our code, which is completely open source developed by several dozen people individually submitting things into GitHub, and then processing this, doc, uh, this um, machine that's produced as soon as any change is made and accepted into the code, is working right on top of producing exactly the same data as what commercial black box software is doing for us, but in a way that everyone can get better output. <coughs> So to summarize here, right, big data is not open, or collaborative, or shareable. It's not even big data. If there isn't code to, gener that's to generate or analyze, it's not reusable. Right? The idea that we need to cycle, that code has to go along with the data to make sense of it. That if we don't have open, common uh, application programming interfaces that are accessible machines, if it's not machine readable, it can't become big data. That's why this work on databases. In meteorological community, we provide a lot on a variety of web readable interfaces like JSON or threads to be able to automatically extract data from large data sources. Um, thinking about data formats and standardization, there's a lot to be done here. The meteorological community, the climate community has really made a lot of gains because of uh, standardization across what's known as the climate forecast convention. All weather models, all climate models produce output with exactly the same variable names and units. And there's a uh, convention called NetCDF, which is a way you share files that includes the metadata, includes the variable names, includes the units, so that any code can take any climate model output and run with it without having to deal. And that's really what's made a lot of weather forecasting happen. Right? There's a similar work right now with something called ecological metadata language. It hasn't gotten a lot of uh, take up right now, but there's a lot of interest in that. And maybe that's the direction we should be taking. And data requires complex authentication methods or the ways to access repositories that aren't open. If you don't have multiple points of entry, you don't have multi a di distributed way to share the data, uh, it's bad. It's, all, it's just not big data, right? Get rid of passwords on your data repositories. It makes my life hell when we're trying to build informatics tools, all right? And make sure you work on data and code sharing policies. They can limit what you can do. It's important to think about the things, the ways your data are going to be used beyond your own ideas. And it's important to set this out to the community and to be open to ideas beyond its intended use. And data QuickBooks, comparisons, documentation on variable names, time sets, they have to be easy to find. Simple tables, online, examples, forums, chat rooms. This is what made Ameriflux happen. And if you want to make agricultural and eco-informatics a revolution here, that's where you're going to have to happen too. So I think I'm probably over time a tiny bit. So I'm just going to skip over this just to say all of this is kind of designed to the idea that part of what's going on is that we have a reproducibility crisis in science. And some people have argued that big data is actually going to make this worse. But I want to try to convince you that if you focus on the tenets of open, shareable, collaborative big data, um, you could actually make this better. And these are just slides showing that in a lot of fields, we have a lot of worry that a lot of the published literature cannot be reproduced. Experiments can't be shown to be true. This is a, a major paper in psychology on the right. This is a survey in biology and medicine on the left that maybe 50% of the published papers are false. 
that's a problem, right? That is a lack of trust in our community is going to build in the public unless we kind of solve some of these challenges. So I'll skip over the work that some of my colleagues have been doing of using GitHub and Twitter and things like that to automate real-time experiments. This is real-time data collected in an experimental lab produced online with real-time metrics of data and the manuscript itself written by anyone who wants to uh, contribute to it. Um, there's some neat products for projects going on. And I think if UW really thinks a lot about how we think about training graduate students, we have a lot of academic staff. Currently, we have a very, it's not, it's difficult for academic staff to teach courses because of the funding models we have. Could we fix that? Maybe. Could we consider more pilot projects? The work that the Advanced Computing Infrastructure and the High Throughput Computing Center here in Computer Science has been doing in the Discovery Institute is phenomenal, but a lot of us are not taking advantage of it. Um, is there more cross-college work? Are there budget models that encourage collaborative grants? Right now, it's kind of difficult, actually, to uh, support funding across colleges in a way that's fair and equitable for everyone. Um, and then this question of you know, data archive sharing, cloud computing, informatics, digitization of metadata might be an area that we really could get into. And the mantra doesn't have to be centralization. Right? I know administrators love to centralize everything, uh, but really what makes UW unique is we're a very bottom-up community, and we, have the, we could step in right into this distributed world, and I think we can do it in a way that's much better than any university out there. So I think I'll leave you to the intermission to say what else, right? What else should we be thinking about? And so I'll just end there, thanks. So just one question, we'll have a shortened intermission, so yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's more of a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for expressing the, the human factor. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. The big human factor, mm -hmm. so that's big these days. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, I, I think that uh, you or we should take a closer look at what the high energy physics community has been doing. Mm -hmm. Seems that uh, if you look at the projects like Neon, mm -hmm. Iceland, and Alive, they are still very much inward looking. Mm -hmm. So uh, having hundreds of uh, uh, authors on a paper is not new for them. Yep. And I think the, the other element that I will bring up in the discussion is they learn how to throw away data. Mm -hmm. And I think this is still an art that this community needs to learn because it's more data is not necessarily better science. Yeah, so that's an excellent comment. And in case everyone didn't hear, the idea is the human factor matters. There's been communities like High Energy Physics that have been doing this for longer. Uh, there's other facilities out there that a lot of the work we're currently doing is maybe more inward looking and that we have to be willing to throw out data. In fact, I've, what I didn't tell you about at Equivariance State is we actually throw out more than half of that data before we actually even send it out to the repositories uh, because we're interested in, we're oversampling the system. And that's something that's also different with big data. We can be a lot more luxurious with how we say, uh, what we consider useful or not useful. And that's a different way of thinking and a different way of doing science. Okay, let's thank Professor yep.